I'll give you a chance to write these four down quick. So number five, just so you have them on your paper for later, y equals 3 plus 3x. Number six, y equals 2 to the power of x. Number seven, y equals x to the power of 3 minus 1. Number 8, y is equal to 8 over x, or 8 divided by x, however you want to write it. And then 9, y equals 4x squared minus 8. And number 10, y equals 3 fourths x minus 4. Now I realize you, you didn't even see those last two until just now, and you most likely didn't get time to graph several of those. But I want to go back through and just give you a sketch of what those graphs should. Did you need me to go back to no, the, the last one? y equals 3 fourths x minus 4. So I want to go back and just give you a sketch of what those graphs should look like. So for number one, y equals 3x minus 2. It's something like that. For number two, y equals 6 minus x. Pretend that's a straight line. Should look like that. How many of you got the first two done and they look just like that? Okay, that's a good start. Number three, y equals x squared plus 2x plus 1. Should look like that. A parabola. Number four, I realize a lot of you didn't get that far. Um, if you use the points I gave you there, it would go something like this. So it looks like that. You'll notice when I draw that one, I put an arrow on this end, but not on this end. And that's deliberate. All of these other ones have an arrow on both ends because they can keep going forever in both of those directions. This one cannot. Because of the square root, if I put in negative 7 for x, y would become the square root of negative 7 plus 6. Well, negative 7 plus 6 is negative 1. If I try to do the square root of negative 1, my calculator is going to say bad things to me. Now, if you were to take a formal college algebra course, depending on what point of view, most likely, uh, starting usually at intermediate algebra, introductory algebra, they most likely wouldn't cover it, but starting intermediate or, or college algebra, they would have what's called imaginary numbers, where you can take the square root of a negative, which basically they just made up answers for it and made a whole version of algebra around it. But we can't graph it on this graph anyway. So for our purposes, this graph cannot go to the left of negative 6. That's a limiting factor on this graph. If this were a formal algebra course, we'd talk about limits on the domain. The, the domain are the numbers you put in for x. You cannot put any x values in here smaller than negative 6. So x has to be greater than or equal to negative 6. We're not going to get that detailed when we talk about it, but I just wanted to point that out a little bit. For number 5, y equals 3 plus 3x is going to look something like this. So another straight line. Number 6 is kind of interesting. y equals 2 to the power of x is going to look like that. It's called an exponential curve. Um, 
this graph actually defines exponential growth. If you look at bacterial colonies, if you do uh, any sort of bacterial cultures in the lab, they will grow exponentially like this. They will double every certain period of time. And you also have exponential decay would be the other one. That would look just the opposite of this. It would look something like that. That would be for like radiation, radioactive decay, and, and things like that would be on the curve like that. Number seven, y equals x to the third minus one. So we have that kind of swirled shape like that. Again, notice all of these still have arrows on both ends. The only one that didn't was number four with that square root. I should go back up to number six too, by the way. There's a limiting factor here. Neither one of these graphs here would go below zero. Y can never be equal to zero or less than zero. That is a line that limits it. That would be called an asymptote. It's a line that the graph can never cross. So both of these, this one here, if, for the red one, if X got really small, like negative 42 or whatever, it's going to get really close to zero for Y, but it will never equal Y. Number eight here is kind of weird. You know, if x was negative eight, y was negative one. x was negative four, y was negative two. If x is negative two, y is negative four. We get points like that over here on the left side. On the right side, if x is one, y is eight. x is two, y is four. x is four, y is two. We get points like that. Well, how on earth do we connect these? Well, the answer lies in what happens when x is 0. If x is 0, what is 8 divided by 0? Well, if we do that again, once again, our calculator gives us, come on, there, force to quit, Ugh, come on. There we go. 8 divided by 0. Gives us another error. Hopefully this one will go way easier. There we go. We can't divide by 0. So x cannot be 0 here. So what we get is actually two separate curves. This one looks like this. This one looks like this. x can never equal 0. So we get another asymptote here. Neither one of those lines will ever cross that blue line because x can never equal 0. In fact, this one actually has an asymptote going this way too because y will never actually equal 0 either. There's nothing you can divide 8 by to make it equal 0. Number 9. Y equals 4X squared minus 8. If you graph it, it's going to look something like that. A very, very narrow parabola. Actually, it's slightly rounded at the tip down there. And number 10. Y equals 3 fourths X minus 4. Should look something like that. Any questions? Now, obviously, at this point, I don't expect you guys to be able to look at the graphs and sketch them out like that. There are definitely things about them that help me to graph them quickly. Not just the fact that I've done them every year for about seven years now. If we look at those, there are ones that form straight lines. One and two form lines. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually do this. I'm going to go back to this page. I'm going to write down the equations of ones that form lines and the ones that do not form lines. 
So we've got y equals 3x minus 2 and 6 minus x. Those both form lines. y equals x squared plus 2x plus 1. And y equals the square root of x minus 6. Both do not make lines. We've got 3 plus 3x. Makes a line. Y equals 2 to the power of x does not. y equals x to the third minus 1 does not form a line. y equals 8 over x, or 8 divided by x, does not form a line. y equals 4x squared minus 8 does not form a line. y equals 3 fourths x minus 4 does form a line. So what I want to look at here is the difference between the equations here, between the ones that do form lines and the ones that do not. More specifically, I want to look at these over here and ask, what do those have that the ones that make lines do not have? In other words, what, what do these have that make them not form lines? So as I look at them, if I look at the first one and this one, these two, and actually those three, what do those three have that these over here do not? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's an exponent on the x. Exponent on a variable. And I should list other than one. The reason I'm listing that is, of course, we know this is x to the 1 and that's x to the 1. A variable is always, always has a power of 1. We just don't write it. So we can't have an x squared like we have here and here. Can't have an x to the 3rd. That actually covers this one as well. Because remember when we talked about order of operations, exponents included both powers and roots. So the square root of x is actually like the power of one half. The next, let's look at this one right here. What's that one have? Yeah, the variable is the exponent. The variable is the power. We can't have the variable in the power, in the, the power of the exponent. And finally, that last one, what's going on there? Division. division. And it's not just division, but we're dividing by the variable. We cannot divide by x. Um, that includes having x in the denominator of a fraction. These things I just listed here are what I refer to as the three don'ts of linear equations. Because those are three things that linear equations don't have. If they have one of those three things, it's not going to form a line on the graph. So as I look at some equations here, y equals 742x minus 9 and 2 thirds. Will that form a line on the graph? Yes, it will. There are no powers on the variable. The variable is not a power, and we're not dividing by the variable.
Y equals 73 over 2x plus 4. Will that form a line on the graph? No, it will not. How about this one? Y equals 3x times 2x plus 5. No. When you're looking at it, say, well, there's no powers. But remember, 3x times 2x is 6x squared. 3x times 5 is 15x. That's really y equals 6x squared plus 15x. So no, that does not form a, a line because it has the x squared in it. How about this one? y equals 7x plus 3 squared. It's tempting to say no because there's the squared, but remember 3 squared is just 9. So that's just y equals 7x plus 9. The exponent only affects us if it's on the variable. How about this one? Does it say anything about x appearing twice? Nope. As long as it doesn't have any powers, any exponents on it, we're okay. So that will form a line. How about this one? Well, I could rearrange that however I need to to make it y equals, and it will not have those things. I'd subtract 3x. So 2y equals 7 minus 3x. And I can divide by 2. y equals 7 halves minus 3 halves x. That is just fine. Doesn't have any of our three bad things. x times y equals 9. Doesn't look too bad, except we have to get it y equals. We're going to divide by x. That's really y equals 9 divided by x. So that one is not. How about this one? y equals 7 plus 3 to the x. No. The variable is the pow in the power of the exponent there. So we can look at an equation and determine if it's going to be a line or not. And that's a big step. So once we know that it's going to be a line, there are some shortcuts we can take for graphing it. So let's look at that right now. See if we can figure out what those shortcuts are. So I'm going to start out with the simplest linear equation I can think of. y equals x. That doesn't have any of those things in it. No powers on the variable. The variable isn't a power, and we're not dividing by the variable. So let's sketch a graph of that. If x were negative 3, what's y have to be? Negative 3, right? Y equals X. So negative 3, negative 3 is right there. If X is 0, what's Y have to be? 0, right? If X is 4, what's Y have to be? 4. Perfect. So 4, 4. So we get a line that goes through the origin, goes through the center of the graph there, and it goes kind of at a 45 degree angle right across the graph, corner to corner. Now, if you think back to when we were solving equations back in the second or third week, when we started out with simple equations like that, as a variable equals a number, we built onto that equation. We were able to add, subtract, multiply, divide, 
Uh, we can do powers and roots, but if we do that, it's not going to be a line. So to keep this a line, we can build onto it. We can add, subtract, multiply, or divide. So let's try to add. Let's do y equals x plus 3. So if I do that, if x is negative 2, what's y have to be? 1, right? Negative 2 plus 3 is 1. So 2, 1 is right there. If x is 1, what's y have to be? Four, good. So one, four is a point right there. If x is, let's go three, what's y have to be? Six. Three, six is right there. So I get that green line. Looking at that green line related to our original line, they're parallel. They go across the graph at the same angle. The only thing that has changed is this green line has moved up three spots. So adding three to the x just moves the graph up three spots. So can you predict what's going to happen if I do y equals x minus 2? Yeah, it's so going to do the same thing. So move it down two spots. So let's try it. If x is negative 3, what's y have to be? Negative 5. So negative 3, negative 5 is right there. If x is 0, what's y have to be? Negative 2. If x is 3, y has to be? 1. So there it is. It's still parallel to that original line. It goes up across the graph at the same angle, it is just moved down two spots from that original. I had mentioned earlier that the reason that this was called the origin is because that's where all of our graphs originate from. That's exactly it. They start at the origin and they move up or down from there. Well, Let's try to multiply. Let's do something like y equals 3x. So if x is negative 2, what's y have to be? Negative 6. Good. Negative 2, negative 6 is right there. If x is 0, what's y have to be? 0. 3 times 0 is 0. So we're going through the origin again. If x is 1, what's y have to be? 3. So I've got 1, 3. So this line goes back through the origin. But what the multiplying by 3 changes is it makes the line steeper. If I wanted to make the line less steep, what do you think I would do? Multiplying makes it steeper. To make it less steep, we would divide. Like y equals x divided by 2. Now, in algebra, we don't like dividing. So what I'm going to do is this. Instead of doing y equals x divided by 2, I'm going to put y equals 1 half times x. Remember from our fractions, dividing by 2 and multiplying by 1 half are the same thing. So now if x is negative 4, what's y have to be? Negative 2. So negative 4, negative 2 is right there. If x is 0, what's y have to be? 0, right? Anytime times 0 is 0. So that still goes to the origin. And if x is positive 2, y has to be 1. So you can see we get a shallower line, a less steep line across our graph. So far now, all of our lines have gone, as we go left or right across the graph, have gone up. What would you think I'd have to do to make a line go down like this? If 
Let's try multiplying by a negative number. So, if x is a negative 3, what's y have to be? Negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6. So negative 3, right, positive 6, right there. If x is negative 1, what do you think y has to be? 2. Negative 1, 2 is right there. If x is 2, y has to be? Negative 4. So get that line right there. So that one does go down across our graph. So with lines, because there's not much to a line, there are only two things we can do to a line. From the origin, we can move it up, or we can move it down, and we can change the angle at which it goes across the graph. So if I have y equals 2x minus 3, I get that information out of that equation. I start at the number that is added or subtracted. This is minus 3. That means I start at negative 3, 3 units below my origin. The number multiplying the x, the 2, tells me how steep it is. That 2 tells me it's steeper than normal. So it's going to be like this. Well, the, the negative 3 here is what we call the y-intercept. And that is where we start. And there's two ways to think of the y-intercept. The y-intercept is how far we go down from the origin to start our graph. So we're going down 3 from the origin, and that's where we start. Or you can think of it, it's called the y-intercept because that is the y-axis. And that's where this line intercepts or crosses the y-axis. So we cross the y-axis at negative 3. The number multiplying the x that determines our angle on the graph is called the slope. And that's why I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about slope and how that works. Slope is defined to be rise over run. When we talked about ratios, we talked briefly about roof slope being rise over run. And that's exactly what it is for graphing. So all slopes are thought of as a fraction. I might be looking at that and saying, well, that's just a 2. It's not a fraction. Well, 2 is thought of as 2 over 1 as a fraction. So from our starting point, which was right here, that y-intercept, that slope of 2 is saying we go up 2 and over 1. And our line goes through those points. So if I have the equation, y equals 2 thirds x plus 1, where do I start that line? At 1 on my y-axis. Perfect. My y-intercept is 1. Or 1 unit above the origin, however you want to look at it. From that point, where do I go? So the positive 1 told me to start up 1, or positive 1 on the y-axis. The number that multiplies the x is our slope. So we have a slope of 2 thirds. That tells us we're going to rise how far? The 2. So we go up 1, 2, and we're going to run 3. So we go 1, 2, 3. There's our second point. And I draw my line through there. Now if those two points are too close together to feel comfortable drawing the line. We can go again. From that point, we can rise two more and run three more if we want to. Excuse me. We get a line that looks something like that. 
So let's say we have y equals 2 plus 3x. Where are we going to start? At the 2. I changed the order around here, but we're still starting at the 2. The 2 is the number that is by itself. The 3 is multiplying x, so that has to be the slope. So we start at 2. From there, what do we do? Perfect. We make that 3 into a 3 over 1. So from that starting point, we go up 3 over 1. And our line goes through those two points. So this one starts at 3. From there, what do we do? We have a slope of a negative 1 half. The negative, perfect, that's exactly it. The negative always goes with the rise. So what that means is instead of going up 1, we go down 1. Then we go over 2. So our line goes through those points. So where does this one start? Negative 2. Negative 2, perfect. And from there, where do we go? Down 3 over 4. Notice the over always goes from left to right. The, the run is always left to right. The positive or negative is with the rise. Positive is up, negative is down. Where does this one start? At 2, from there, where do we go? Perfect. It's just minus x. We treat that as a negative 1x. So it's negative 1 over 1. So yes, from that starting point, we go down 1 over 1. And there's our line. Now, they don't all stay quite that simple. There will be one or two of them like that on the test that are simple. Unfortunately, they do have to get worse. Of course, right? That's my job is to make it worse, right? So looking at this one, what's the problem here? Exactly. Our y is not by itself. It's y plus 2. All the other equations we graphed, y is by itself. It's y equals. So it's just like solving our equations from before. We have to get y by itself, so we have to get rid of the 2. The 2 is added, so we get rid of it by subtracting. Now, when we add or subtract on an equation, we only have to add or subtract one piece on each side. So we subtract, subtract 2 from the 2 here to make that 0, make that go away. Leaves us with y. On the right side, we only have to subtract 2 from one of those two digits, from one of the two pieces. Can't take it away from 1 half x, so I'm going to take it away from the positive 1. So our 1 half x doesn't change. Positive 1 minus 2 is negative 1 minus 1. So where does that one start when we graph it? Negative 1, and from there we go up 1 over 2.
This one has a similar issue. Y is not by itself. In this case, Y is being multiplied by 3, so how do we get rid of it? We divide by 3. When we multiply or divide an equation, we must multiply or divide every digit. So 3y is a digit by itself, so we divide by 3, cancels out the 3. 2x is a digit. 2x divided by 3? Well, that doesn't work out evenly. So the way we do it is just this. We take the coefficient of the x, the 2, we put it over the number we're dividing by, the 3, to make 2 thirds. So that's 2 thirds x. So we turn the division problem into a fraction. And then the 6 is a digit. 6 divided by 3 is positive 2. So to graph that, where do we start? Positive 2. And from there? Up 2 over 3. Perfect. So, how about this one? We have the y is not by itself yet. So we have to get rid of, and this time we've got a 2 and a 3 there. We've got to get rid of both of them. And just like solving equations before, we had to do a reverse the order of operations. This was built by the y was multiplied by 2 and then the 3 was subtracted. To take it apart, we take off the last piece first. So the first thing we take off is... The 3, it's subtracted, so we take it off by adding 3. So adding 3 makes it go away. This is now 2y. Remember, when we add or subtract, we only have to do it to one digit on each side. So I'm going to have to add 3 to the negative 1 over here. So the negative 3x doesn't change. Negative 1 plus 3 is positive 2. Now what? We have to divide by 2. And remember, when we multiply or divide, we have to do it to every digit. So the 2y divided by 2, the 2's cancel out, I get y. Negative 3x divided by 2 is? Perfect. Negative 3 over 2 times x. 2 over 2? 1. So to graph this, we start out at positive 1, and we go down 3 over 2. And of course, the worst they could get would be something like this. Where do I start there? I have to get y by itself. So the 4 is multiplying the y and the 3x is added. So I end up subtracting 3x. I have to subtract 3x from the other side. Unfortunately, there's nothing over there that I can take it away from, is there? 8 minus 3x becomes 8 minus 3x. Then what? Divide by 4. So the 4 cancels out. I get y equals... What do I get on the right side? Two. 2 minus 3, 4 is x. Good. 8 divided by 4 is 2. Negative 3x divided by 4. Again, we turn the division into a fraction. Negative 3 divided by 4 becomes negative 3 over 4, or negative 3 fourths, x. So where do we start on the graph with that one? At positive 2. And from there we go down 3 
over four. So I want to talk more about that idea of slope because it is such an important concept. Slope is a rate of change. If I have two points on my graph, let's say I have a point here like 2, 3, and let's say we've got, oh, let's do 6, 5 right here. And I have a line that goes through those points. Now this line may keep going through those points. But I know it goes through those points. To find the slope, I have to figure out, as I move left to right, how far I had to rise and how far I had to run. And I can draw that in on the graph like this and get it. The rise is going to be this distance right here. Well, the rise comes from which coordinate, the x or the y? Which coordinate says it goes up and down? Y. So here, the, the y coordinate here is 3, and up here it is 5. So we go from 3 to 5, that's a rise of 2. And it is positive because we do go up. Our run, then, is this distance. What coordinate goes side to side? X. So we go from 2 to 6. That's a run of 4. So we have a rise over run of 2 over 4, which reduces to 1 half. So we have a slope of 1 half. In fact, if we have two coordinates, we can find the slope without having to put them on the graph. Because we see here, the rise is just the difference in the y coordinates, and the run is the difference in the x coordinates. So the way we, we do that, the way we label that, looks like this. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And let's take a peek at what that means. If I give you two points, like 7, 1, and 3, 11. I am going to label one of them point 0.1 and the other one point 0.2. Slope, now the abbreviation they use for slope, um, because S is used for so many things in math, they use the letter M for slope. Y2 goes first. That means we look at point 0.2 the y coordinate, which is 11, minus y1. We go to point 0.1, the y coordinate, which is 1. That's 11 minus 1. Over x2 it means we go to point 0.2, the x coordinate, which is 3, minus x1, we go to point 0.1, the x coordinate is 7. So now we do our subtraction here. What's 11 minus 1? 10. 3 minus 7. Negative 4. Now to simplify this, a positive divided by a negative is a negative. And both 10 and 4 can be divided by. 2, so it gives me 5 over 2. 
So that's a negative 5 over 2 slope. Negative 5 halves. I would not want to reduce that to 2 and a half because the slope is a rise over a run. It's a ratio. And remember, when we're dealing with ratios, we don't convert them into mixed numbers. That formula can be a little tricky if we have negatives here. So I'm going to label them points 1 and points 2 again. My slope equals, what's y2 here? Negative 11 minus, what's y1? 7, good. On bottom, what's x2? 5 minus, what's x1? Negative 3. So negative 11 minus 7 is negative 18. 5 minus negative 3, positive 8. So a negative divided by a positive is a negative. Both 18 and 8 can be divided by 2, which gives me a 9 force. So negative 9 force slope. We'll talk more about slopes and rates of change next week. For now, some homework to look at. Page 205, 1 through 3 is just looking at graphs and reading coordinates off the graph. Page 213 through 217 is more looking at graphs. 1 through 15, the odds. Page 221 through 222, 1 through 15. And page 226, 1 through 15, the odds as well. So it's the odds except for that page 205, 1 through 3. I'd like you to look at all three of those. So I said next week we'll talk more about slope. We'll talk about variation and more relationships. And that should wrap up our graphing unit. Any questions? Okay, you guys have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Thank you.